Elizabeth Copeland and Robert J. Sawyer. So yes, uh, we certainly have a writer who knows the publishing industry inside and out. But I have to say, after that reading, I'm beginning to think Orwell wrote books to ward off the future. 1984 was written in 1948 to prevent that future. Why did you have to be pro so prescient? You should have been warding off Trump, not... Yeah, you know, you know? it's very it's very discouraging. Um, Carolyn, my wife, where is she? There she is. Uh, we watched uh, the newsroom, not the CBC version, but the... Uh, the um, Aaron Sorkin uh, TV show, The Newsroom, recently. It was a few years old. And at the end of it, I said, Aaron Sorkin must feel like the most impotent man on the planet because he wrote The West Wing. <laughs> and then he wrote The Newsroom. And both of these were cautionary tales in a way. And you know, no matter what artists seem to do, we don't seem to have that power that uh, we thought we had to actually help affect a course correction. It's discouraging. It really is discouraging. I um, was hoping that I would uh, beat the US. I didn't think in this election, a guy gets elected in my novel in the next election, four years from now. I didn't think that the US was so close to electing an authoritarian, so close that, that, that the racism that was clearly simmering under the surface during Barack Obama's administration, uh, I didn't realize just how close that pustule was to bursting open broadly. Uh, it's very discouraging. And I know, you know, uh, there are a lot of people who have different politics than me. I can recommend some writers that'll make you happy. <laughs> I might not be the writer for you. But it's, it's difficult to um, be chronicling uh, a lot of the, the things that are happening in civilization these days and feeling somewhat ineffectual about being able to be heated. I feel like Cassandra. Well, art has been around for a long time and I think you're underestimating the uh, impact. Uh, there's that famous saying from uh, thousands of years ago from Islamic culture, which is, an enemy is someone whose story we have not yet heard. So the power of story to yeah. change uh, the world is uh, we, we, your your novels are typically utopian, are typically idealist rather than dystopian. So I think that you've been bucking the trend, the trend there, and I'm going to get into that. But um, by any reckoning, Robert Sawyer is among the most successful Canadian authors ever. That's a quote from Maclean's National or National News Magazine. I'm going to be using quotes in this interview, primarily your own words, Rob. And I'm going to I didn't ask, say that. That was uh, Brian Bethune who said what you. That's that's wrote. true. That Those were not his words, yeah. but. Um, I'm going to ask Rob to expand on the points that uh, these quotes make so our audience can hear a couple of the keys of your craft if there's writers out here, aspiring writers who've come, um, and some of the recurring themes of your 23 novels. And I also want to give a, a glimpse of the man behind the famous celebrated author persona. And we, I only have a half an hour. looming like behind Hillary Clinton, the man behind. <laughs> Alec Baldwin. So, <laughs> So I'm going to get started. Yes, sir. Uh, the secrets of craft. To be su a success as a novelist, job number one is to write books that stand out from the uh, countless competing novels on the bookshelves and the bookstores that come and go. And you've used a number of strategies to do so right from your very first novel, Golden Fleece, published in 1990. Here's a quote that you'll recognize. Your words. Part of the Canadian psyche is a belief that the only way to succeed on the international stage is to disguise the fact that you are Canadian. When I started off writing, when Rob started off writing, he expected that there would be a list of failed books, movies, and TV shows that had formed the basis of this belief. But it seemed everyone had just assumed this would be true. No one had tested it. Yes, and I'm an empiricist at heart. That's a theme that the character, uh, Caitlin, in my novels, Wake, Watch, and Wonder, keeps saying. And it's... Uh, one way that she and I are similar. I think you have to test things. I literally was told that over and over again in the 80s when I was contemplating writing my first novel. Novelist after novelist, everybody, uh, readers said, don't set it in Canada, it'll never sell, it'll never sell. And I thought, wow, I mean, who is the poor guy who's impoverished on the street corner with a tin cup begging because he was foolhardy enough to write a novel set in Canada that showed that you could not make a success of this? 
And I could not find any evidence that this had actually been tested. In terms of popular fiction writing, of course, uh, I studied Canlit at university. Many of you have taken a Canlit course and have read, you know, Margaret Lawrence and Margaret Atwood and, and uh, all of these people, Martha Stenso, all the people who wrote the great Canlit novels. Um, but in terms of popular fiction, mystery, thriller, uh, romance, science fiction, horror, had anybody tried this and failed at it? And nobody had, and I thought, I was starting just at the beginning of the word processing era. Right? My first novel was 19, I was writing it in, in the late 80s. And it was still, a lot of writers were still working with typewriters. And I thought, you know what? Okay, so if I put Toronto in there, so if I put all kinds of Canadian references in there, if the editor says, no, make it Chicago, it isn't me having to retype 300 pages. It's me sitting there and doing it in 15 minutes with search and replace. And I thought, I'm gonna take the shot, I'm gonna try. And as you said, 23 novels later, I've been published by four of the five big New York publishing houses. Uh, so you got one more to bag. I know, I got one more to bag, right? Uh, and never once has any American publisher, editor, agent, bookseller, reviewer, or reader complained about the Canadian content in my books. It was a non-issue. Now, my friends who write mystery fiction, and there's some great Canadian mystery writers, as I'm sure you well know, Peter Robinson being a, for probably first among equals, and great thriller writers uh, like Linwood Barclay. Um, most of their stuff is not set in Canada. Now, why is that the case? And I actually had an interesting conversation with Peter about this. And the bottom line is that the laws of physics, which is what governs science fiction, are the same on both sides of the 49th parallel. The laws of the land are different. So. When you try to write a courtroom drama set in Toronto, people want to know why, why you're not uh, pleading the Fifth Amendment. They want to know why you're not asking for a sidebar with the judge. If somebody in a courtroom says, may I approach the bench, that's when the guard moves and tries to tackle you, right? You're not allowed to approach a Canadian seated judge. So uh, there is a difficulty perhaps there, uh, but there isn't anyone in science fiction. And I thought if anybody could explore strange new worlds, I would be science fiction readers, and it's given me mainstream bestsellerdom in Canada. Canadians love the Canadian setting. That scene was an aberration, practically the only American set scene in the whole novel. I guess there's three in the whole novel. Almost all of it is set in uh, three quarters in Winnipeg and one quarter in Saskatoon. You can't get much more Canadian than that. And it's been to my great success in Canada uh, being flagrantly Canadian, and it hasn't hurt me in the slightest, not one iota, not one centimeter in Canada or one inch in the States to be flagrantly Canadian. Give me a list of Canadian cities you've set in your novels. Well, there's probably fewer that I haven't. Kitchener-Waterloo, of course, is the setting of Wake, Watch, and Wonder along with Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, End of an Era is set mostly in the Badlands of Alberta and at Triumph, uh, the Tri-University Maison facility in Vancouver. Uh, frame Shift is set, uh, the Canadian parts are in Montreal. Um, lots and lots of stuff set in Toronto, which is where I, I live. I live in Mississauga, actually. Terminal Experiments in Toronto, Calculating God is in Toronto, and uh, so on and so forth. In fact, I've only ever set two novels in the States, and both for reasons of amping up the action. Basically, the first one was Frame Shift, and it was about um, uh, the evils of the health insurance industry, which, of course, in Canada, where nobody can take away your health insurance, they're not as evil as they might want to be if they were constrained. Uh, whereas in the States, there was, you know, I was writing about this whole issue that's the, at the cornerstone of Obamacare, Obamacare uh, right now is pre-existing conditions, right? In Canada, it doesn't matter what you're born with, you're covered till the day you die. Uh, in the States, they can say, oh no, you've got a pre-existing condition, uh, even if it hasn't manifested itself. So your predisposition to heart disease or diabetes, dementia, Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, what have you, makes you de facto sick, even if you've manifested no symptoms. Uh, so that novel was mostly set in the States, Frame Shift. And Illegal Alien, which was a courtroom drama with an extraterrestrial defendant, the uh, extraterrestrial was on trial for murder, and I wanted the punishment to not be a stern talking to, but actually the death penalty of found guilty to raise the stakes a bit. And so that one was set in Los Angeles. That's another one of your uh, techniques to, to uh, stand out in the market was from the very beginning, again, 
was to fuse yes. the murder mystery, the uh, crime drama, and science fiction. Not, not a lot of writers in the 80s were doing fusion novels, but you started. That is true. Fusion. My very first one, Golden Fleece, and about half my books are fiction, are, are, sorry, science fiction mystery crossovers. Most recently, uh, Red Planet Blues, which is a hard-boiled detective novel set on Mars. Uh, and one of the reasons I do that, I, in retrospect, there, there are reasons that I didn't realize at the time. At the time, I simply realized that both science fiction and detective fiction tries rational thought, right? Detecting is the process of rational thought. What can you build up from the clues? And uh, science fiction, of course, is all about rational thought. How can we reasonably extrapolate into the future? And also, the reader of detective fiction and the reader of science fiction are doing the same thing. They're looking for clues artfully salted in the text that don't draw attention to themselves, but in retrospect complete, uh, make a complete picture. In detective fiction, it's for all the clues are there so you can solve the crime. And in uh, science fiction, often if the setting is anything other than the present day, the clues to how the world is different from ours are artfully salted as background details. But the other thing is they're both expository genres. In uh, the legal thriller and the detective novel, that's a branch of literature where you can actually go up to another character and harangue them until they answer your question, right? <laughs> you say, where were you on the night of August 4th? How can you prove you were there? Is anybody there to witness what you did? How do we know that you weren't, so you know, that kind of stuff. And those novels are very much about drawing out information. And people love it in mystery fiction. They also love it in science fiction. People at the end of reading a good ambitious science fiction novels say, wow, I finally understand quantum superposition, or I finally understand, uh, you know, cladistics, which is a way of classifying uh, life forms that I never understood before. And they're thrilled to have learned something. The exposition-rich genres work very well together. Not many science fiction novels have a bibliography at the back. That's true. So Quantum Knight has an over 50 item uh, bibliography at the end. Take a look at the uh, back of Rob's When you get novel. it safely home after buying it, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, another strategy you use. Here's a quote from an editor you both, uh, both of us know well. Robert J. Sawyer has a way of taking familiar ideas, looking at them from new angles, and in greater depth than almost anybody before him and tying them together to create extraordinarily fresh and thought-provoking stories. Now, Rob has dealt with most of the classic tropes of science fiction, the space station, the uh, all sorts of the aliens. Um, and my experience uh, reading the first novel I've read of yours, which was Flash Forward, I was astonished at how you took the ideas in that book and went further and further and further until I kept thinking, well, I know where this is going, and you went a thousand miles past it. I'd like you to, to contrast, if you will, there's two novels. Your novel, Wake, is set in Waterloo, and you lived in Waterloo. You have yes. a special connection with That's this true. town. You lived in Waterloo in 1980, and you did a draft of your first novel. End of an era. End of an era, not the first published, but, but the first, first one That's that you right. wrote. But you also read a book, science fiction book, that was set at the University of Waterloo. Yeah. And it was about a uh, computer system that was an, uh, becomes an artificial intelligence called The Adolescence of P1. Any of you read that by Thomas Ryan? Okay, so I'm going to get Rob to contrast how the difference between the computer system, the artificial intelligence, and the adolescence of P1 learns to read books, and so does the artificial intelligence in your book. And the difference between those two is the reason, part of the reason you've been so successful. Well, thank you, sir. Right? The quote you read was from Dr. Stanley Schmidt, the editor of Analog. Uh, exactly and, right. Uh, to what we are? That's exactly right. Yes, oh yes. I, I, I know who said things about me, naughty or nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to catch you out before the evening. Um, yeah, you know, this is, Stan said that, and it was very kind of him, And because I have dealt with a lot of the classic themes of science fiction. I'm a middle-aged or better man now, 56 years old, and um, so many of the classic treatments of things in science fiction were written by, say, Isaac Asimov when he was 18, or 19, or 21, and had never been on a date, and, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> the treatments which we think of as so profound because we read them when we were 13 or 14, actually don't hold up very well when you read them in middle age. There isn't a lot of depth. There's a lot of cleverness, but not a lot of depth. And what I found very fruitful was to go back and look at some of the standard 
notions in science fiction, the first contact novel, the uploaded consciousness consciousness novel, the time travel novel, and try to bring uh, really adult sophistication to it uh, instead of going, oh wow, that was just really neat and cool. Uh, and also bring a level of characterization to it uh, that I hoped uh, would appeal to people who had had some life experience. You know, Asimov had very little life experience when he was writing the books that we all think of as seminal at this point. Uh, to what you said there, it had bothered me so much. There were so many novels about artificial intelligence and movies. Um, Adolescence of P1 is one. Uh, another film that some of you may know is The Forbidden Project, uh, which starred uh, Canada's Susan Clark was the female lead, and of course Eric Braden, the male lead, based on a novel called Colossus by D.F. Jones. Uh, and in all of these novels, even in, in Neuromancer by William Gibson, the ramping up to actual consciousness and actual comprehension by a machine happens off stage. Always. You don't see always, always. off stage. Yeah. And uh, part of it is because nobody really knows how it happens in us. You know, you don't remember anything before you're three, four, five years old. So your first cognitive <laughs> steps are lost to your own memory. You have no, no way to reach back and say, well, how was it that I first learned to negotiate three-dimensional objects and understand that this podium is in front of that person, is in front of that window? Where did that, it all happen, all that wiring happened, and you've utterly forgotten or never laid down memories of when it occurred. And I thought the challenge was, all right, let's write this. Let's start with the first dawning moment of perception in an artificial intelligence and not ever once do misdirection. Not ever once say, oh, look over here, somebody's attacking, uh, you know, uh, the European Parliament. Oh, wow, explosions. And you come back and ha ha, the machine is now taking over the world. No, every step of the way. And I think that's what Stan was alluding to, that I yes, go back exactly. and just, no, let's, let's not gloss over the hard parts. The hard parts are what make it interesting. Well, laziness, too, as a writer. You know, the, I think these writers would go, well, gee, that's an awful lot of work for me to have to imagine. Imagine how these technologies that have been uh, tropes of science fiction for 50, 60 years. Rob uses his imagination, and that, that's the unbounded comment that, uh, that Sheila made at the beginning, a, a writer of a of, of boundless imagination. Um, so that certainly has been uh, one of the key strategies that have separated you, made you stand out. Here's one, uh, again a quote from you. Philosophical, this is uh, my little title here, philosophical idea-driven science fiction with mass appeal, which is unusual. And here's your quote, we have to walk a delicate balance with my books. I'm published separately by a science fiction imprint in New York and, and Penguin's Canada's mainstream imprint. Each of my books must work well with the genre science fiction fans and also appeal to the mainstream readers. That's tough to do. Not many people in the field can do it. Michael Crichton could. Michael Crichton Back in the could. Day. And, he, and the irony, of course, is that Crichton was kind of an anti-science uh, fiction yeah. writer. Every time there was a scientific breakthrough, it was disastrous. We would have been better off if it hadn't occurred. Whether it's cloning, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's a nanotechnology, whether it's genetic uh, manipulation, whatever it is, we would have been better off if it had never occurred. And I certainly am not anti-science. But you're right. It's a very tricky thing to appeal to both audiences. Uh, partly, uh, I had kind of an epiphany that science and fiction are equal length words, seven letters each. And so many writers of science fiction either write science fiction or they write science fiction. And they don't do science fiction. They don't give equal weight to the two parts. And uh, the mainstream readers, by and large, take as a given that my science is accurate, just as they take as a given that uh, John Grisham's legal uh, maneuvering is accurate in one of his novels. Um, but they are immediately attuned to whether or not a character note doesn't ring true. If some bit of dialogue or some emotional reaction, no, nobody ever behaves like that. Whereas a lot of science fiction writers over the years, Asimov, Clark, uh, Heinlein, to name the big three, were utterly indifferent to reality in terms of the way their characters acted. Try to find anybody, you know, Heinlein's wonderful characters only work well in a universe populated by other Heinleinian wonderful characters. As soon as you run into somebody who is not 
completely committed to Heinlein's philosophy of you should know when to take orders, when to give orders, when to stand out of the way, it all falls apart. Asimov was utterly naive about women, completely and totally naive about women. I think his whole life he was. And um, seriously, I mean, he was, he was a father to a daughter. I know his daughter, Robin. Uh, he was married twice, but I don't think he ever in the slightest understood women. I mean, he was worse groper than Donald Trump has ever been accused of, <laughs> and thinking he was doing a favor by uh, groping. You know, oh, they could go and tell a story about how the great man grabbed them. Uh, no, you know, I mean, utterly, really utterly clueless in a kind of um, uh, asperger yes. kind of way. You know, it's been said that Asperger's is the national religion of science fiction, that there's an awful lot of people who read science fiction who read it because they like the technical material. The only mainstream author who has the same sort of audience outside of science fiction would be Tom Clancy, whose novels are through filled with in-depth technical details that you can read and enjoy without ever having to sully yourself about wondering, but what about the human beings and how they're affected? If Aspie's like a science fiction character, they're data or some robotic-like character, yeah, I've certainly read that. Um, you know, you're, you mentioned that the science fiction writer, the classic trio, Clark, Asimov, and Heinlein, the Golden Age writers, they did not tackle something that you tackle regularly in your books has become one of your main themes. I did say I'd touch upon the key themes of Rob's books and ethics, morality, and philosophy mm -hmm. are unusual subjects in science fiction. You would think they'd be more in science fiction. If you go back to some, somebody like Orwell, okay, you're talking political philosophy, but Ethics and morality is central. The, the two themes that seem to be your core themes are consciousness yes. and ethics and morality. Yes. yes. Which make you stand out right away. I'm going to get on to this point, which I think is a last bit of craft before we get to the next section. Career craft. You had a big turning point in the year 1995. This is yes. the first time I, I became aware of you as a writer is, is because of Terminal Experiment. But in 1995, Rob took a big gamble as a writer. He had, he had uh, a number of novels out. And I'm going to give you your quote here. Um, I decided I'd write my next book without a contract, take as long as necessary, produce a blockbuster, doing the most complex, sophisticated story I could manage with the most subtle, realistic human characters possible. More than that, I wanted to tackle a controversial issue and not disguise it, but deal with it rather uh, head on. Now, H.G. Wells and all the, the, the great writers who founded science fiction certainly founded it as a, as a genre of social criticism, but they hid their social criticisms in metaphors. So when aliens invade uh, from Mars in, in Wells's classic, it's really India being invaded, and he was t he was critiquing the British invasion and and the cruelty of British soldiers to the to the uh, uh, Indian subcontinent. Um, so the time machine he's talking about British class structure. Yes, but you wanted to do it without the metaphor, yes. Yes. and you went for it, and you knew that this was going to be a big gamble. You had uh, not done this before, and. Um, you decide to tackle abortion. Yes, I did tackle the abortion issue by name. Tricky issue for an American genre. Yes, and uh, I had done five novels at that point. Uh, when you sell a novel to a publisher, they usually acquire what's called an option to your next work, which means they have the right to see it first before anybody else does and make the first offer. So Ace, which is uh, now part of Penguin Random House, their science fiction imprint, uh, was entitled to see this book, and I submitted it and the editor there said, no, we can't publish this, it's about the abortion issue. And I said, yeah, that's exactly what it's about, and in part, anyways. And she said, no, the only way we can publish this is if you take all of that out and just make it about a mad scientist. And I refused, and I had no reason to believe that anybody else was gonna publish it, but I was stunned because my belief was that since almost 100 years, not quite at that point, since H.G. Wells, that we had enough openness in society that we could talk about controversial issues 
without having to say, oh, it's aliens, oh, it's Eloy and Morlocks, oh, it's uh, Martians, you know, uh, but that we could actually talk about things head on. And I discovered, no, science fiction is, I was going to say chicken poop about a lot of things. It's commercial publishing. And they said, we'll never be able to sell this particularly in the American South. And uh, I, re I refused to make the changes. And what was the great turning point in my life was my agent at the time, Richard Curtis, who has also been your agent, Jim Gardner, the great uh, Kitchener science fiction writer right in the front row there, I had Richard as well for a time. Uh, Richard um, sent it out to every other publisher around, and there was only one, a new startup line from HarperCollins, which did not have a science fiction imprint to that point. Uh, and they said, what the heck? We need somebody who has some sort of name, we'll try this Sawyer thing. And it went on verbatim without a single word of change to win the Science Fiction Fantasy Writers of America's Nebula Award for Best Novel of the Year. And I was right, fundamentally, and Ace was wrong. And Ace ultimately, 20 years later, bought the rights to the book to republish the book. It now is an Ace book after, it had, after HarperCollins had wrapped up their line. Uh, and so, and they apologized. But they were so scared that the audience couldn't handle direct discussions. Because, you know, the attitude is, and some of you have read, people often write to me about calculating God. And so what do you really believe? And I say, it really doesn't make any difference. I will tell you if you want to know, but it doesn't really make any difference. If you can't discern it from the book, what my position is, that's perfectly fine. It's designed to make you question your position, whatever your position is. I'm a provocateur. My job is to simply make people think. It's my great friend, Ted Bleeney, right over there. Ted and I were in high school together, and we used to spend, and Ted and I have different beliefs about religion, we have different beliefs about politics, and we used to spend into the wee hours arguing, 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 as if the, most, the fate of the world depended on it. And we don't do that anymore, to the great delight of your wife and mine. <laughs> but, because you know we've, we've known each other an awfully long time. But the thing is, almost nobody does that. You do that in high school, maybe you do that late night dorm room sessions at university. And then you don't anymore. Somebody just posted on my Facebook wall today, I learned long ago that it's pointless to talk about politics. My God, the world is driven by politics. The world is at a crisis point in politics in the, the EU right now and in the United States right now, in, uh, in um, uh, Argentina right now, all over. Uh, uh, there are political crises of enormous import. And to say, oh, uh, my job is to not make waves. No, my job as an artist, as any, any serious artist, is to make waves. And one of the things I learned about science fiction is an awful lot of it is about just filling shelf space with fungible, interchangeable uh, military SF adventure novels, space opera novels, uh, media tie-ins, Star Trek and Star Wars novels, things that are completely safe, and the publisher knows before the book is even written to within 500 or 1,000 copies, how many it's going to sell, because they know how much titles in that category sell. No waves made, it's a good money maker for the publisher, it's a minuscule living for the authors in most cases who do it, but the publisher in aggregate knows if they do 20 of these fungible novels a year, they will make enough money to stay in business. And I rail against that as an artist, and I know Jim has written very provocative stuff. You were talking about some of your titles here, and I was thinking just this week uh, when uh, we had yet another campus um, uh, event that Jim wrote an incredibly powerful story called, um, I won't get the whole title, Kent State Descending the Gravity Well Variations, give me the- uh, Analysis of the Observer. An analysis of the Observer, Variations is another one. I mean, we write because we're so angry and so upset about this wonderful world that we thought we were going to be moving into in the 1960s, such an era of optimism that we want to scream and yell in our books. And even if we're not screaming and yelling, we want you to think, right? You know, some of you will say, oh, I don't think Trump is that bad. Well, that's fine. Think about why you don't think he's that bad. Think about what your priorities are if you don't think he's that bad. Think about what's important and become you know, they say an unexamined life is not worth living. An uninterrogated belief is not worth having. I'm constantly reading conservative stuff to challenge my perceptions. I'm constantly uh, arguing with people still, I, you know, uh, hopefully not 
quite to the wee hours of the morning as Ted and I used to do, but still wanting to have an intelligent, creative debate with somebody about issues because otherwise, what's the point of it all? You know, I'm glad you chose the direction you did back in 95 because you had two directions you could have gone at that point. You had novels that you were working on, Starplex, yes, which were, you'd grown up reading, as uh, this quote from you, you'd grown up reading far off future, yes. off earth, spaceships and alien science fiction, but the terminal experiment succeeded because it was none of those things. That's right. And then you had a choice between you because you had two novels coming up, one frame shift, which was similar. Yes. Uh, which tackled these controversial subjects and was mainstreamish and science fiction and Rob ended up choosing that direction. So that 1995 novel was the turning point. Absolutely. But it, you know, it, in this novel, uh, Rob continues to do that. Uh, it's been called his most Canadian content. But uh, here's a quote, um, the novel brings to the fore uh, Quantum Night brings to the fore one of our Canadian national disgraces, the tragedy of missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls. It's partly set in Winnipeg, so you never miss a chance to to bring the science uh, straight into the real world that we all live in. But I'm going to, uh, and, and I'm glad you did make that choice yes. and choose the right yes. fork. Um, I'm going to skip ahead you know, while now. you're skipping out. Just say so you know, there's a reason. One of the reasons the book is set in Winnipeg is that. Uh, Winnipeg is actually at the Forks. Right? Not only is it the geographic center of uh, the North American continent, but it is at the Forks of the Red and the Assiniboine River that is really where you can branch down two paths and at the confluence of the Forks is the new Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Uh -huh. And it really is, we're at this kind of turning point where here's the crux, we have documented everything that we've ever done wrong. We don't bury it anymore, right? Germany doesn't bury anymore. They talk about the Holocaust and their complicit, uh, you know, uh, does, depend, does depend we, on the country. It does depend on the country. But we as a mature country now are talking about our appalling treatment of our indigenous peoples, right? And that's important that you reach a point of maturity where you can say, okay, our past is not to be quite literally whitewashed. And uh, I think it's so important that science fiction be part of that. Not, you know, there is escapism. Not escapism, Rogue One premieres next week. Go watch it. <laughs> You've never been a Star Wars fan. It's a Star Trek. This is Star Trek had the interracial kisses and the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they broke all the rules. Um, the man behind the celebrity, I know we're, we're ticking along here, so I'm watching the clock. Um, I wanted to give you a glimpse of, of Rob the man. And I'm going to give you my own experience. Rob the teacher, here's a, here's a quote. Rob holds honorary doctorates from the University of Winnipeg, Laurentian University. He's taught writing. Rob is a mentor to many, many Canadian science fiction writers uh, in two ways. I mean, uh, teaching craft at workshops, but also uh, you know everybody in New York. Anytime I read a book, about uh, this agent is talking about this part of, of uh, publishing, Rob will say, yeah, I had lunch with him two weeks ago. You know, it's annoying. <laughs> but um, mm. you have taught writing at the U, at U of T at Tattle Creek, and that's where I studied under you. Yes, yes. In 2003. Um, Ryerson University, Humber College, the Banff Center for Fine Arts. You've been writer in residence at Richmond Hill Public Library, which was the first place I met you. Yes. I went there in 2000. And uh, the KPL, the Toronto Public Library's Merrill Collection of Science Fiction, Speculative, Speculation and Fantasy, Pierre Burton House in Dawson City, you were a writer in residence there, Canadian Light Source Synchrotron. Now this is a guy with cojones because he goes <laughs> to a synchrotron, Can Canada's big uh, laboratory in Saskatoon and says, this is a great cutting edge laboratory for science. You need a writer in residence. I'm a science fiction writer, <laughs> I'm available. And so they took him and that's how that began. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, do they still continue to do that? No, it was, it was a one shot. You, you it ruined it for them. There's that's, nobody no, who they, they can't replace you. Irreplaceable, that's right, that's right. Mm. Yes. So when I was, here's my personal story. When I was a student at uh, Tattle Creek at U of T, um, and I met Rob there. 
he I, I was uh, he noticed uh, it was a weekend workshop and I was very tired the second day and Rob said to me you look very tired and I said well I'm staying with a friend in Toronto who has a lot of cats and the cats keep jumping on me in the middle of the night and I'm not sleeping and so Rob says to me well come and sleep at my place this is the man who has befriended so many. I did not take him up in his offer. I did see Rob's home at parties he has hosted for Toronto's science fiction community. People come to those parties from the US, by the way. Um, but I want to talk to you about, uh, and I want you to talk about, friendships at science fiction conventions. You're all familiar with Harry Potter. Harry Potter lives this horrible life, and then he gets to Diagon Alley. And any science fiction fan is familiar with that story because when Harry gets to Diagon Alley, suddenly there's this magical world, and that is the, the sense of a 15 or 16 year old. I don't know how old were you when you went to your first science fiction convention, but I was 16, and it was like I'd reached Diagon Alley, and you get to the World Science Fiction Convention held once a year, it's Hogwarts. Yeah. And you can make lifelong friends. I mean, uh, the, the theme of the Harry Potter novels is uh, people making, uh, Harry makes these lifelong friendships and, and um, you, tell us about the lifelong friends you have made at conventions. Sure, you know, Ted and I co-founded our high school science fiction club in 1975. Last year, Carolyn and I, and I met my wife Carolyn in that club, we held a 40th anniversary reunion party for our high school science fiction club. And we had people who had moved as far away as, as Los Angeles come back to Toronto because the club had been so central to their lives and their experiences. Uh, my first science fiction convention, I was 15, I think it was, a Fanfare 3 here in Toronto. Carolyn was there, but we hadn't met yet. Uh, and um, most of my long-standing friends I met at science fiction conventions. We met at a convention first. This is James Allen Gardner, great Hugo Award-nominated science fiction writer. Uh, and I would say that's absolutely true that Hayden, Hayden Fenholm, uh, Jane Ann, I met at the Merrill Collection, right, first. But I see you, yeah, but I see you frequently at conventions, right, and many other people here I see in the back and so forth. Where's Nick? Nick? Right, a lot of people, science fiction conventions are, people talk about their tribe, right? And the only thing my tribe has in common is their love for big ideas and speculating and get sinking their teeth into interesting issues and uh, not necessarily personal hygiene. And I find <laughs> that at the science fiction convention, you get all of that and I thoroughly enjoy it. I thoroughly enjoy it. We actually, I, Probably have to let these people ask questions. Yes, today. indeed. You've got so many. I have, I have one more. One I'm going to go back to childhood. Uh, your dad. Yes. At the end of every week, my father took me down to the Royal Ontario Museum Saturday Morning Club. I believe that was a lasting influence at the. Absolutely. So, the Royal Ontario Museum and your dad. Oh my God, the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, since I was a little kid, kindergarten or before, I wanted to work at the ROM and be a vertebrate paleontologist studying dinosaurs. Um, the ROM has a thing called the Saturday Morning Club for uh, school kids, and my dad actually was the head of an institute at the University of Toronto that happened to have its office just a, a block and a half from the ROM. So he used to, after doing teaching and doing research for a full week, Monday to Friday, Saturdays he would drive me and then my friend who was also in the club, Dave Raymer, down to uh, the ROM, drop us for the club, three hours later we'd walk over to his office, drive us home. And I just was fascinated by the ROM for a number of reasons. I wasn't aware of how unique the ROM is. I know there are no degrees of uniqueness. Uh, but it is a multimodal museum. Most museums in the world are not. Most museums are either natural history or their archaeology or their um, uh, science and technology. They're one specialized thing. And the ROM is by no means the largest museum in the world but it is one of the world's largest multidisciplinary museums where you can find Burgess Shale fossils, the world's best collection is at the ROM, where you can find uh, Chinese artifacts, the world's best collection of Chinese artifacts outside of mainland China is at the ROM, where you can find textile collections, the world's best collection of textiles is at the ROM, where you can find people doing archeology, span anthropology, paleontology, uh, uh, ethnology, etymology, textiles and, and Greek and Roman um, uh, mythology and all these things all under one roof. 
And I didn't realize until years later that that crucible of everything being thrown together under one roof was so much what became the heart and core of my science fiction. I write science fiction that is interdisciplinary. In fact, I was very fortunate that McMaster University sought out my archives a few years ago, and I donated them to them. And in honor of the donation, they held a three-day academic conference. And the conference they asked me, what should the conference be called? And I said, science fiction, quote, or colon, the interdisciplinary genre. Because I firmly believe it's the only place in literature where completely disparate um, fields come together and spark off each other. So that, for instance, my novel Hominids, that won the Hugo, is about paleoanthropology and quantum mechanics. Boom, where do those two fields ever come together? Uh, quantum Night, of course, is also about quantum mechanics and sociology, particularly the sociology of crowd behavior. Where would those come together except in a science fiction novel? The ROM is a place where every discipline was working together under one roof. Uh, fascinated me and, and put such an imprint on me. Hominids, a trilogy about uh, early man. Yes. Calculating God, aliens arrive on the steps of the room. Yes, they do. Yeah, so I, I saw that, that those Saturdays with your dad, uh, dinosaurs oh, in yeah. uh, the Quintaglio, di intelligent dinosaurs. I think there's a theme through all of your novels that those Saturday morning visits. Absolutely, absolutely. My dad is 92 now. He's still Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Toronto, although he hasn't been in to do anything for quite some time. But, um, but he's still mentally sharp and agile uh, for a man of his age. And uh, yeah, I owe him an astonishing debt. I hope he realizes it. I try to make clear to him uh, by being a good and dutiful son. Uh, I know many of you are at the same age that I am. We're dealing with elderly parents is, is a major part of your life. Uh, but there was no doubt that he and my mother, who died just about one year ago this week, um, who was also an academic, uh, fostered an intellectual curiosity in me. Uh, you know, I had an allowance. My parents were both uh, economists. And so I remember at like eight, having to give them a pie chart showing how I would spend my allowance <laughs> to justify the amount. But there was a get out of jail free card. Anything that was deemed educational that I wanted, they would buy. If I said, you know, I've got this much to go to a movie at the Willow Theater in, uh, in uh, North York where I grew up. I've got this much for a candy bar or whatever, and maybe saving towards a toy. And, but, oh, I want a book on dinosaurs or on minerals or on butterflies or on whatever, the night sky, whatever. That, no problem. My dad had a very close relationship with uh, the special order desk at uh, the University of Toronto bookstore, right? That's a bookstore that doesn't normally order in children's dinosaur books, but they would do it constantly. My dad going, oh, he's interested in dinosaurs now, and they would order it in. He wants to know more about astronomy, and they would order it in. And that was on top of anything that I had saved my allowance for. And I'm so grateful for that, for that to this day. We, we should go to the audience now. Questions? I, I was just wondering, write something, you put it out there, do you ever want to revisit, like, you know, Brave New World, revisit? No. Um, it's an interesting question because, for instance, Terminal Experiment came back to be reissued by a different publisher, and that was 15 years after it had been first published. Do I want to rewrite the book, bring it, you know, into line with my new thinking? And what I've come to realize is, first off, I have so many things that I want to write now that going back and revisiting something would probably be a sad waste of time. Um, I really enjoyed the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy BBC radio series. And I enjoyed the BBC Guide to the Galaxy TV series. And the BBC Guide to the Galaxy, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books. And the Hitchhiker's Guide, and, and you know, Douglas Adams could have given us so much more if he didn't go back and keep revisiting the same material over and over again. It was a loss to us. And I also, I have changed. I change every year. My politics change, as everybody's does. I become, you know, as Barack Obama, and I was always in favor of marriage equality, but Barack Obama was challenged. How come he flip-flopped on it? He says, my thinking has evolved on that, right? My thinking has evolved on a lot of things. I even agree with Ted every once in a while now, <laughs> after all these years. And uh, to go back would be to try and shoehorn Robert J. Sawyer of the 21st century into Robert J. Sawyer of the 20th. And these are snapshots. And I did about one book a year for a quarter of a century. They were snapshots, a flip book 
of my evolving consciousness and to go back and say, oh, I don't think of that way anymore. I've changed my mind about this. No, I wouldn't want to do that. And in fact, I was just on the phone yesterday with one of my Hollywood agents. Um, we're trying to sell Illegal Alien. And um, the people who make, uh, I shouldn't tell you, well, one of, the, one of the big HBO series right now really like um, uh, the pilot script that I did not write for Illegal Alien. Somebody else wrote the script. I could have written the script. Somebody else wanted to write it. I said, it's perfectly fine. I've got other things I want to write rather than revisiting something. And um, uh, the company that's interested in it right now uh, said, but you know, we have, we have some issues. We might want to change this or that. And I said, go ahead. Go, I don't care, change it all, right? At this point, um, the last thing I want to do is argue for a position that I held 20 years ago when I wrote that book. So no, I, I, I'm quite content to have them out there. There are things, you know, you always, you, you, if you have an infelicitous phrase, oh man, I could have polished that better, of course, right? You cringe uh, if you feel that you made this mistake. But in, no matter which author you're reading, you're gonna reach a point, you know, there's a point in the Gettysburg Address where I think, Lincoln could have done that better, right? And it's only about 400 words. Right? So. Well, you've also evolved as a writer. I get to see, a uh, number of us here get to see Rob's yes. books before they come out, and we see them in draft form. And as I said about this one, each book, that that drive to be more accessible to the uh, the, the reader of not, the non-science fiction reader, that has become stronger and stronger. And this is is really uh, it's accessible to, you know, you can give it to your parents type of thing. You can give it to people who don't read science fiction, they're gonna get hooked on it. That wouldn't be true if you go back to those. So that evolution is certainly, any other questions? Here's the moderator. If your Facebook page is any indication, you're really enjoying uh, movement screen right now. I was just wondering, um, is there another Robert Sawyer novel in the near future? That's an interesting question. Marcel, I had dinner with my friend Marcel tonight, and he said, I heard you say the phrase, my next novel, which I have not said for a couple of years, because I am somewhat disenchanted with the publishing industry. Uh, to give the tiniest little example, last week, uh, Penguin Canada, some of you, anybody come and see me when I was out here in uh, April, March and April, touring for Quantum Night? All right, I just drove here, that was easy. But I was on book tour across Canada. So I racked up some expenses, all of which were approved before I racked them up. Sent in an invoice in April, and I got reimbursed in November for the expenses, seven months. This is totally typical of publishing, totally typical. Uh, they hold on to the author's money as long as possible in the hopes that you will die and your heirs will not know that it's actually owed. It's unbelievable. And so I've been disenchanted by the publishing industry a great deal i can give you i could go for hours with the reasons and you know i asked most of my friends who are authors did you have your best year ever last year and almost none of them say you know it was terrible but did you know that f uh, five out of five of the big new york publishers had their best year ever last year yes they did they found it by finding all kinds of ways to carve more and more keep more and more of the profit of the books let, give disperse less and less to the authors and have all of the things that technology have t done to make book publishing cheap and simple to do these days, keep every cent of profit from that. It's infuriating. But the answer is, yeah, now uh, trying to decide between two really interesting novels that I'm simultaneously researching. Uh, and all I'll tell you is I'm reading an enormous amount for one about the nature of time and why there is a perception of now why this moment feels different than the moment that just passed and feels utterly different than a moment that's gonna happen right now. And the other is about the Manhattan Project and I've been immersed in both of those and a novel will emerge after I decide which one is going to be the next, I think, which one I'm gonna focus on.